Good morning, church. Welcome, and welcome to all our guests this morning and our guests that might be joining us on Facebook and YouTube. We are so glad you uh, could join us this morning. It's also so nice that uh, I don't think we no longer have to choose whether to uh, isolate ourselves in the back or be all together here in the, uh, in the auditorium, right? It's, it's a pretty nice feeling. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, when we were moving all the chairs and making space, I was like, oh, yeah, it's about time, right? Amen. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. Um, just a couple uh, needs that I kind of wanted to, you know, that we wanted to put before the church, and that was just uh, one of those needs being uh, Steve and Laura, our, 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 our uh, couple and our uh, tech gurus that, that head up the soundboard and the the wonderful slides, and they keep uh, Pastor Tim on point and on cue with <laughs> where he needs to be in his message. Well, Steve's back there by himself today, uh, making Delane sound wonderful and also making sure the church stays on beat with the slides. And so, you know, if God puts that on your heart to uh, maybe, you know, rate, rotate and help with the slides and, you know, jump in there. Um, also, if y'all, y'all guys haven't been noticing, uh, some of our elementary kids are now joining us in uh, service with us. And so, uh, and that reason being um, that we no longer have somebody to, uh, you know, teach the kids and be with the kids uh, while the adults get to be in here. And, you know, of course, we love the kids. They're obviously more than welcome to be here. Um, but, if, you know, if you weren't aware of that need, uh, that is also a need that we have here in the church. Um, so, and if you're thinking, man, I'm not good with technology, I'm not good with kids, but I'm good at persuading others, Right to maybe do something like that, then uh, by all means, God might be calling you to do that. So, <laughs> uh, um, and joyful giving, uh, we just pray that the, that the Lord continue, uh, that the Holy Spirit continue to lead you and, to give um, in whatever way, in whatever capacity he is leading you to give. And uh, we continue to, um, you know, keep the lights on here and support uh, our community as well as uh, missions around the world. And so we're grateful um, for you guys and y'all's prompting of the Holy Spirit to continue to give. Um, and then that just leads me to communion. Um, just wanted to, as I was, I was, I was thinking and I was reflecting, right? Um, just thought to myself, how, how, how many of us did good this week, right? How many of us did good? How many, how many of us had a, had a list of maybe 15 good deeds this week, <laughs> right? Or how many of us uh, experienced grief this week, right? Maybe we just, I know for me, it's a, I think it's constant grief, especially with work, right? Like, man, I did not put in the hours that I wish I could have put in, or I didn't get the reward or the reap that I wish I, I would have gotten, right? Um, and that just kind of reminded me of uh, Jesus's, um, uh, exchange with a rich man in, chap- in Matthew chapter 19 um, when he, he approaches the rabbi, right? He approaches the teacher and says, hey, what, what good deed must I do in order to get into heaven, right? And, and for me, um, and then, you know, they kind of start having that exchange and Jesus asks him, you know, keep the commandments. And he's, he's like, yeah, I keep the commandments. Well, oh, good for you, man. <laughs> I definitely don't, unfortunately. <laughs> um, Right. And um, and then Jesus says, right, in chapter, I mean, in verse 22, uh, actually 23, sorry. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say to you, only with difficulty with a will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Thank God there's more. Right. When the disciple heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Right. And so for me, I'm grateful that we have a weekly reminder. Right. Of what Jesus did on the cross. But more than anything, I think I need a daily reminder. Right. That it's not on me. I don't have the power. I don't have the capabilities or the capacity to do enough good deeds. Right. Good thing I am. And so today, that's why I take the bread. Right. That represents Jesus's body that was broken for me and the juice that represents his blood, the new covenant. Right. God's saying, I'm now going to do your part and I'm going to do my part. Thank God. (laughs) Right. And so uh, church, we take the body at this time.
and we take the juice. And Heavenly Father, we just um, we thank you for your Son that is a, a sufficient sacrifice. He came on the cross, died for, our, died for our sins, and has made us in a right standing with you, that we could approach you freely and boldly. To your name we pray, amen. I also wanted to remind us uh, for just as the summer comes, kind of starts coming along, we have our visitor cards. If you're a visitor with us this morning, um, there's one in each foyer. I, was, I should have put that before communion, right? Ruined a pretty good moment there. <laughs> um, you know, if you, f- you feel lead to, led to fill one of these out so that we can stay in contact with you, please do so. Thank you, guys. Amen. Thank you, Gabriel. Appreciate Gabe um, and his heart to help us with our student ministries. I did want to um, say thank you to Delane and all of you who work in the music team. I appreciate uh, all of the effort that you guys put into it. Um, I was thinking about this morning, you know, how easy it is for us just to take for granted things and forget like, hey, these people, they come every week, uh, during the week, and then throughout the week, and they practice, and then Delane organizes it. She actually puts a lot of work into, like, what songs we're going to sing, because I usually give her my sermon title um, beforehand, then she can try and um, think about what kind of fits, and you always do a wonderful job, and I just want to tell you how much I appreciate um, all of you and your your sacrifice and participation. And then I see Sadie over there, and I need help. Because Sadie's looking for a job, and I've been praying for two weeks, and she hasn't gotten a job yet. So obviously, uh, I'm not, I need help. So as a church body and family, I'm gonna ask you to pray that Sadie will find the right job. She's looking for a job in social work. And um, God help her. Um, But um, would you just all join me in just this week, just praying that she'll find the, not just a job, but the job that God has prepared for her and that she'll know exactly where to get it. And then um, being a social worker, the offerings are just going to jump like, so high. Um, Anyway, but if you'll be praying about that, um, I wanted to thank everybody who's helped me with the um, food distribution uh, in India and Sri Lanka. Every week as funds have come in, I've been sending um, uh, food supplies to, I sent, there was a hundred pastors, families who needed, I was able to send food to, then another hundred families in leprosy camps, in Sri Lanka got uh, food distributions during this week, and that's because you guys were so generous and supportive of that, and I really want to thank you for participating um, in that. Um, Vanessa was going to try and come to church today. She said, listen, I can take a, a Tylenol codeine 3 and probably make it through the service, and I said, well, do you think that's the best decision? Um, like, Maybe you should just like stay home and lay in bed and watch me on Facebook, and then I won't see when you're going like this. <laughs> um, so she decided to stay home and rest out. She, Tuesday she's going to, I think she's seeing the nurse practitioner, but it's going to give her some kind of results from her last x-ray, and then hopefully we'll have a pathway forward. So if you'll just keep praying about that. Um, Monday, I'm going to be flying to, well, that's tomorrow. Tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, I'm flying to uh, California for my dad's funeral. My dad passed away about eight months ago during the whole COVID thing. We couldn't have uh, a service, and he wanted to be cremated, but he wanted his ashes to be in the same um, plot with my mom, who were both um, uh, veterans, and they're so... That's going to be at the the uh, Veterans Cemetery in San Diego, so we'll have that this week, and um, 
pray that Southwest Airlines doesn't cancel my flight again because um, I got a little news blurb that they canceled some thousand flights this week, and I'm like, no, no, thank you. Um, so if you'll pray for that, lots of things for you to pray for. Excuse me. My friend um, Jack Purcell put out volume two of his book uh, on the journey, and there are copies available, and he would even be willing to sign them. Jack has been writing articles um, for the Bernie Star for decades now, probably. Um, but they're just really insightful things, and they're great little devotional material, like if you haven't read them all. Um, so I encourage you to, to see Jack in um, the back there. Did I forget anything? With a memory like mine. It'll probably come to me tomorrow. Um, I think I got most of it. Anyways, we're in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> And uh, we're already in chapter number 14. Amazing how fast uh, we're going through this. Uh, in the beginning of chapter number 14, we see that the Lord is preparing the disciples for what's coming. And, uh, you know, they had uh, some struggle trying to figure out, like, uh, what's happening here. Because they had some expectations uh, that weren't being met. Uh, they had an idea that uh, Jesus was here. He was gonna, they, they, they recognize that he's the Messiah, but their, their plan for the Messiah was that he was going to establish the throne of David and take over and his earthly kingdom was going to be established and they had kind of figured out how they were going to be in places of prominence and authority and, and they were going to be a part of the movers and shakers the power structure of the new uh, government and jesus comes and disrupts their plans for him and says no i'm going to the cross i gotta die and they're like, well, how, how's that going to work? Because their focus was who was going to be number one. You know, they said uh, they're journeying down the, the, the road with Jesus, a uh, little behind, and they're having a little conversation. And it's like, I'm going to be number one. I'm going to be number one. And the other one's like, no, you're not. I'm going to be number one. And then they had a little discussion. Jesus says, hey, what are you guys talking about? Oh, nothing. And then he brings them to this place, and he says, if you want to keep your life, you lose it. And if you want to, if you lose your life, you gain it. And so he's establishing a paradigm for them that it's just really hard for them to process. He says, I must die. And then he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And so he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. You don't have to worry. I'm going to the cross to provide a place for you in me and to prepare you to be a place for me. I'm going there. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And I started thinking about this, and I'm like, you know what? If we're not careful, our hearts are going to be filled with with trouble because we listen to the wrong news. Now listen, I'm not saying you have to be like me where you never watch the news. I'm not saying that because I still get news reports and I figure without even wanting to know it, I'm going to get some alert that alerts me that there's trouble in the world. But if you are one of those people that are watching, and I don't care, like you're watching Fox News or MSNBC or whatever news, I don't care. If your mind is filled with that news, you're not going to be focused on the good news. You see, that's the whole thing, because the enemy uses this news to get our hearts troubled and our focus on everything but the king and the kingdom. 
And Jesus is saying, and I'm not saying be ignorant. I'm not saying, you know, of what's going on. But listen, you got to make sure that your mind is more saturated with the king and the kingdom than what's going on in the world because we are only pilgrims in the world and our solutions in this world that we live in are not what's going on here. It's the eternal so make sure that the good news, that, that he's done it and he's doing it and he will do it, uh, is the primary focus of your attention. Uh, it's the only way that we're going to live in peace. The only way that the people who are professing the king and the kingdom uh, are going to avoid the troubled heart. And so let's start um, in John chapter 14, in verse number four. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn there. Um, am I the only one that brings a Bible to church anymore? I, I'm using, oh, God, thank you, people. Yeah, and, and then the rest of you got your phone or your tablet. It's cheating. Like when I was a young Christian, man, we had sword drills. Do you guys know what sword drills are? Like they had this thing, we'd have contests, right? And they'd say, they'd say, and you gotta like swim through your Bible and you gotta find it. You guys are cheaters. You just like go. Da, 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 da. But anyways, uh, off the point. Uh, <clears throat> this is like the most profound thought here. Jesus is laying it out. He says, and you know the way to where I'm going. Remember, he says, I'm going, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then he says here, and you know the way to where I'm going. You know the way. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, Father, we thank you that you are who you say you are. And Lord, I pray that all of those beautiful songs that we sang that they would just be confessions, that they would um, really be the expressions of our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would have complete liberty to speak through me, your servant, into the hearts of your beloved children. And I pray, Lord, that it, if anyone's here or listening that doesn't know you, that they would experience you like never before. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So you start off uh, the passage, and uh, here's Jesus, and he's laying it all out there for him. And here's Thomas. Jesus says, hey, you know the way to where I am going. And we always call him what? Many of you said it, right? Do you see how difficult it is once you get a reputation? I mean, instantly, 2,000 years later, here all of you are still slandering the poor Apostle Thomas and calling him Doubting Thomas. But I would like to propose to you that we give him a new name and we just call him Honest Thomas. Because... He was there, and he's listening, and he's saying, uh, could you say that again? Uh, could you run that by me again? Uh, what are you talking about? I mean, you got, here's Jesus, right? He spent three years with these guys, day in, day out, all day, all night, and they absolutely didn't get it. And yet he has this gentle response to them to remind them, to pull them in. Uh, he, he's just perplexed, and he's not afraid to say, I don't get it. Run it by me again, Lord. I love that about him and 
I love the way Jesus responds to it. Because you know what? If we're honest, a lot of us, we just don't always get it. But we feel like church isn't a really safe place to ask questions, so we just keep our, ma- uh, our mouth shut and our mask on, and, and we don't ever really get to it. And we have a Jesus, we have a Lord who says, listen, come on, I'll bring you along. I'll help you. Because whenever we have expectations of what God is going to do for us or how God is going to work for us, uh, we're going to find ourselves in a place of frustration. And so they were frustrated. They didn't get it because they had already made plans for what he was going to do. And God never really feels obligated to come into agreement with our plans. He's calling us to come into agreement with his plans. He says, we know you, Jesus, but we didn't know you were the way. You see, he says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know? He says, uh, what's the right path? Because he was looking for a what? You see, this is kind of how religion gets settled in our hearts and, and, and abandons the good news. Because religion is always about what we do, where we go, and how we get there. And Jesus is reminding us that the gospel is different from religion in this sense, that it's not about what we do or how we get there, but who he is and what he has done. And so he declares to honest Thomas, he says, listen, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He himself is the the way. And there's the problem, right? Because most of us do life our own way. Most of us live life the way we want to live, and we're a little frustrated when things don't go the way we want because we're living life our way, and we're asking God to, here, come in and facilitate my way. Uh, many decades ago, when I left business, I was in this large church in, uh, in Long Beach, California, and I was like the executive pastor and young couples. And, and so we had a city councilman in our beautiful city of Long Beach, which if you know anything about Long Beach, it's really not that beautiful. But um, we're there, and one of our city councilmen, who was quite infamous for... Uh, dirty politics and whatever. He, he died of something, and they said, well, can we use your church because you have the biggest auditorium? And so they let him have it, and they're there, and I'm supposed to be the one facilitating, make sure you have it, and they have this funeral, and they sing this song. I did it my way by Frank Sinatra. As though that were something to brag about. Now, you can thank God I didn't start singing, um, but that is, in fact, the very problem. He did it his way. When I do things my way, when you do your, uh, your, uh, your life your way, it inevitably causes chaos in our lives. You see, because religion might be all about setting you out on a pathway of things that you need to do, a way to get there, a way to get to heaven, a way to get better. But Jesus is saying that's not really good news. The good news is that the way is me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You see, because Jesus is not introducing us to a new religious philosophy, he's inviting us into a relationship. But see, most of us think of this all backwards, you see, because we think the gospel is how we get fire insurance so that we don't go to hell when we die. And so we believe in Jesus and we, 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 we pray the prayer and now we've got Jesus and now we've got heaven as our home when we die, but it's hell on earth until we get there. Why? Because we did it our way. 
because we forget that the issue of the gospel is not just a change in destination, but a journey with a person. Now, I don't know, probably not. Probably none of you do stuff like I do. But I can be very focused, like, on a journey. And Vanessa and I, when we were coming back from the mission field, we had this little system. We'd come back from Asia. We would land in Los Angeles. My friend who worked for Nissan Motors always arranged for us to have a, 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 one of those vans, you know, and he would set it all up for us. We'd land there. We'd get the van. We'd pack all our stuff. There'd be seven of us in this van, which left very little room. We had a cargo thing. We'd pack it up. And almost inevitably, the first meeting we'd have to raise money or visit supporters would be either Maine or Florida. So you land, you get there Monday morning, and you know me, Mr. Uh, we got to do something here. Let's see how fast we can get to Florida. We need to be there by Sunday. And so, you know, those things are amazing, right? You can, you can go like 365 miles on a tank of gas. And I would tell the wife and the children, hey, listen, uh, we're going. Uh, we will stop for the bathroom when we stop for gas because we are on a mission to see how fast we can get to florida and so we would go whoo, and i would stop the van would open i'd say you guys you got as much time as you need as long as you're back in the car when i'm done filling up the tank so get to the bathroom get something to drink get back in the car we're going we are on a mission we're going to florida and then, you know, we would get there, and I think, you know, like two, uh, two days and so many hours, and I would think, you know, I think next time we can do it better. <laughs> Finally, on one of these trips, and me being the maniac, because, you know, we're then we're there three days early or whatever, I don't know, like, the maniac, and my wife says, would you stop it? I go, yeah, but... We could get there 30 minutes earlier than that. We could break the record because it's all about the destination. She's like, honey, it's about the journey. What good does it do for us to get there early if everyone hates you when we get there? But see, most Christians live just like that. They know that the destination has changed from hell to heaven, but they forget that Jesus isn't just concerned with changing your destination. He came to be the way. He came to invite you as a journey in life to do life with you. And so he says, listen, I am the way. But not only am I the way, I am the truth. I just got to say this, because, you know, if I haven't offended everybody at least once a week, I don't feel like I've done my job. But there is the most obnoxious thing going around, and it's this. Well, my truth is, and then another person says, yeah, but my truth now, your truth might be that, but my truth is this, and that truth, people, truth is not subjective. You cannot have your own truth. There is not your truth and my truth and his truth and her truth. There is truth, the person. And as our lives don't come into sync with the person of Jesus, it's deception. It might be your deception, it might be my deception, but it isn't my truth. Because the truth is not a what. The truth is a who. The truth is Jesus. He says, I'm the way, I am the truth, I'm the life. He says, listen, there is no true life, nothing eternal, nothing sustaining apart from me. So that's why he said, when you lose it, you gain it. 
Because when you lose it, when you release it, you receive him who is eternal life. Yes, you get to go to heaven when you die, but why live in hell while you're here? He says, listen, go on a journey with me. And this is all about how Jesus is expanding the revelation of himself. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I mean, this is an astounding claim. Jesus does not say, I show you the way, I teach you the truth, I lead you to life. He goes, I am those things. He's not merely a way shower. He is the way. No other religious leader could ever make such a claim. The Buddha called himself a guide to the way. Muhammad called himself a prophet and a teacher of the truth. I mean, and there is some truth in the Quran. There is some truth in the Book of Mormon. But none of these people or writings are the truth. None of them are the the way none are the life only jesus can make that claim he is the source of truth and life the ultimate reality and no one comes to the father he says except through me he is the only way to know god as papa you see if you don't know God as your papa, you're not experiencing everything Jesus has for you. The Jewish mindset, they worshiped God, but they didn't know intimacy with God. They didn't know a familiarity, a, a, a closeness with him. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you want to know God as your Abba, there's no other way. I'm the only way. You see, because the good news is always about what Jesus has done. The reason he goes to the cross and declares it is finished is because he meant it, it's finished. He's removed all of the obstacles to us having a relationship. We, we who are aliens and enemies are brought in into the adoption of children. And now we see him not as the scary God of the universe, but we see him as our own Papa. We see him in a new way. So yes, when we die, we go to heaven. But he says, listen, I'm here to be life with you, to, to be on the journey with you all of the way. There's no other way to this as relationship. You see, religion in the negative sense is always about what you got to do. And this is the problem, right? Because in our Western world, we, we've kind of got everything turned around. And what we, what, we, what we present is we say, like, okay, here we are, the good people, and we want to go out into the world and invite the other good people so all together we can be better people. And the sinners, they don't want nothing to do with us. But it's all built on a false assumption, which is that there are good people. You see, that's not the gospel, that's religion. And we need to start asking ourselves that if we are authentically and genuinely disciples of Jesus Christ, why are we not attracting the very same people that Jesus attracted? I mean, if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, if he's the one that draws all of us in, we need to start asking ourselves, okay, wait a second, something's funny here because we don't feel comfortable with the same people that Jesus felt comfortable with. Now, who did Jesus hang out with? He hung out with what the Bible calls 
all kinds of notorious sinners. Now, religious people did not like this. It didn't make them feel comfortable. They were like, hey, uh, you are eating with the wrong people. If you were truly a prophet, you would know what kind of woman that was. And yet, they all wanted to be close to him. And so what I'm presenting to you, friends, that if we are going to walk with him and journey with him who is the way, the truth, and the life, we need to let ourselves become uncomfortable and be welcoming and loving to the same people that he is because he's in us. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Jesus came that we might know him as our Abba. There's no other way to this relationship. You might be tempted to say, well, you know, Pastor Tim, you're a very narrow-minded kind of guy. And I'll say this. Jesus was a very narrow-minded kind of guy. Not in the way that you think. Listen. Listen. I was thinking about this, right? There's a lot more in our lives that are narrow-minded than we want to think. If I want to call Delane, I still have to punch in the right numbers. I was going to say dial, but that would kind of date me. If you guys don't know, like, Google it. What does pastor mean by dialing a phone? And you'll see, there's this, never mind. Um, we used to actually do that, remember? Anyways, thank God for just pushing that button. Um, it's narrow. Because there's only one way. There's only one truth. There's only one life. And you, you, you can be an expert in doctrine. But if it doesn't reveal the life, it's not Jesus. I mean, that's the problem, right? Like we can become so expert in what we know to be the truth and forget to experience him who is the truth. I'm not saying doctrine's bad. I'm saying doctrine is not a substitute for a relationship. He says, if you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Thomas had seen the Father because he had seen Jesus. I mean, you say, well, what does God look like? He looks like Jesus. And when Jesus has liberty to live and express himself through us, what does it look like? It looks like Jesus. He's gentle and kind. He's a lover of sinners and publicans. He hangs out with lepers. He heals the sick. He causes the blind to see. There's no one that he's not willing to touch and embrace. Know what Jesus is like and you will know what God is like. Sometimes we think, oh, that Old Testament, that's the mean God and Jesus is the nice one. But that's just because we're interpreting the old one through the wrong lens. We need to begin to look at everything in the old through the lens of who Jesus is, and then we begin to see who God really is. Thomas's problem was not that he did not know the Father, but that he didn't realize that he knew the Father. He was in ignorance. He didn't know what he didn't know, or he didn't know what he did know. He just didn't know. He said, man, uh, show me the Father. And he was right there because the Son and the Father were inseparable. Thomas had been on a face-to-face, first-name basis with the God of the universe, and he didn't know it. He says, but, because, but now you know because you have known me. So friends, are you living with the 
intimate knowledge that the God of the universe has made a room in you? Because that's what the context is all about. He goes, I'm going to make a place for you. And, and he goes, I made you suitable to be a place for me. But I think we go through all life and we think, well, you know, I don't know, as bad as it is, you know, uh, here's the world going to hell in a handbasket and I'm just hanging on till heaven. And he's saying, why don't you go on the way with me? Why don't you journey with me? Why don't you find out how I want to express myself through you? This is why we must understand that discipleship really isn't just about learning facts about who God is. It's not about just the things that we know, because we can know all of the right things, but it's about experiencing him who is God living in us and loving us. It's like we were talking about a few weeks ago. Like you got to live every day as someone who is loved or you're never going to be an agent who loves in the world. He's living in and through us. Look at verse 8. and I love it, right? So honest Thomas, and now we have Philip. Philip said to him, um, okay, Lord, show us the Father and that's enough. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So now Philip speaks up, and he hears all the, and, and you need to hear all the yearning and hunger that humankind feels for God, because man isn't whole apart from God. He's always searching until he experiences who God is for him. He's trying to fill the void with things or actions or activity, and there's no substitute for him. And he's saying, listen, how can you miss it? Uh, Philip's saying, okay, well, show us the Father, and we're good. And our Savior's quiet rebuke is, don't you know me? Philip, haven't we been together a long time? It, it, if you know me, you know the Father. Don't you know that he's in me, I'm in him? And, and it's just kind of a, a beautiful picture of how complex it is when we think about the Trinity. That there are three persons, one God. It's the truth and a paradox. It's, it's beyond our comprehension. There's really nothing in life that really helps us explain it really fully. He says, don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? And Jesus said at the beginning, he says, you trust in God. Believe also in me. And what is it? Faith is trust. Faith is the assurance that whenever we fall, we fall into the arms of a loving God. If all of this is too much for you to believe, he says, look at my works. Look at what you have seen. You've seen the dead rise again. You've seen the, the man born blind to, to see. You've seen the deaf hear. You've seen the sick healed. You've seen thousands fed with the lunch of a little boy. You've seen miracle after miracle. If you don't understand the words, look at what you've seen and believe. And then in verse 12, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this, will, uh, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So I want to take a few minutes real quickly and break this down for you, okay? Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. 
Anyone who believes in me, anyone who has faith in me, anyone who has entrusted me and received me into themselves, this is the person who keeps on believing in Jesus, the person who continues to grow and trust as a Christian. He says, you're going to do what I have been doing. Yes, they were first addressed to the apostles, but they applied to us. They did, they'd seen healings, they'd seen the dead ride, the, the blind to see, the, the lame cure, the lepers cleansed, and the promise was literally fulfilled in the book of Acts, and we saw that, that, that Peter and John healed a man who was lame from birth. We saw Peter raise the, the young woman uh, Dorcas from the dead. The, the apostle Paul delivers people from demonic oppression and illness, and we even see one time where Peter's walking by and the shadow covers a, a person who's sick and instantly he's healed. And what does he say? He says, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. And it has been fulfilled. And, it, and he wants to fulfill it. See, I've met some people and they, I don't know, They'll say stuff like, okay, well, that was then, and this is now, and God did mir miracles then, but he doesn't do them now. And, and they have a real tight, neat little theology and explanation for it, and I say, hooey. If your God is so small that you can fit him in a small box, well, then he's not really God. My God is the master of the universe. And what he did in his life and what he did in the apostles' life is here and present in you and I today. And he says, let's get to work. But see, as long as we're doing life our way, we are not going to experience him working through us. Now, we sang some really powerful songs, and you should be thanking God that I don't have time to remind you of what you just sang. But if you meant just half of what you're saying, man, our lives would be completely transformed. He's saying, listen, and greater works than this will you do because I'm going to the Father. He says, listen, I'm going to the Father, but I'm not leaving you alone. We're going to see a little bit later. He's like, listen, I'm going to be living in you. Why does he live in us? So that he can live through us. He says, listen, you saw me do miracles, but I'm going to do even greater miracles. Greater works. Only in the sense of greater in spiritual dimension. None of us are going to do anything that equates to what he accomplished on the cross. But he's saying, listen, because I went to the cross, I'm going to, I'm going to live in you. On the day of Pentecost, just 40 days after this, uh, promised to the disciples that the apostle Peter was empowered by the Holy Spirit and he preached such a mighty message that 3,000 people were converted in one day. Jesus never had that happen. I, I, I remember stories, you know, Billy Graham preached on the parable of the prodigal son in, in, in the Wembley Stadium in, in, in London, I think it was 1955, and the, I think they recorded 3,000 conversions in his ministry in Palestine. Jesus probably never spoke to a crowd much larger than 7,000 to 10,000. Uh, the evangelist Luis Palau, he, he passed away recently. I think he, he had reported that had some like 700,000 people in a meeting in, I think it was Brazil or, or Guatemala or somewhere. I can't remember the place. And then, and then Billy Graham, they, they counted and estimated over a million people in the square in Seoul. This is just one generation ago. You see, friends, we gotta, we got to start living, uh, get ourselves free from the ignorance. What, what were we just singing? Something, a let it all fall away? What, uh, yeah, something like that. Um, let, let it all fall. It's not him. Let it what? Let it all fall away. 
He said, listen, I came because I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life, and that's not distant from you. That's not somewhere else. He says, it's me, and I live in you. And he goes, I want to do these great works. I am the source of the power. I produce it in you. If you'll just simply release me, if you'll simply consent to be my instrument, if you'll simply desire to participate in what I want to do in the world. The point is that Jesus predicted that these greater work, works would take place, and they have taken place, and they, can, and they should continue to take place. When our focus is on the king and the kingdom, we will see these great works. They will flow from a life of dependence when we are free from our self-absorption. Because this is kind of like how it breaks down. That most of us have gotten so preoccupied with trying to find security in life apart from Jesus that we think the sum of my life is all about the things that I can accumulate. We say, okay, well, now I'm secure because I have this. I've got this set aside. I've got this house. I drive this car. But the problem is it's never enough. I was thinking about it, you know, this week. I was like, you know what? All of my problems are first world problems. They are. I mean, I go to 80, 90% of the world, and I talk to them about their, my problems, and they're like, wow, uh, can't identify. Because you know what 90% of the world's doing? They're trying to figure out how they're going to eat. Trying to figure out how they're, how they're going to have a place to eat. They don't, they, they don't know my problems. But all of my problems are centered around me instead of Christ in me. What does Christ want to do through me? You see, he says, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. That's good news. But it's not a magic formula. See, so too many Christians, they, they've watched too much Christian TV, and they think that Jesus is the, the God of the genie, and if you just rub the genie, what do they call that thing? Um, the lamp. Yes, thank you. Thank you, children, for being here and helping me. Woo. How do you rub the lamp? You rub the lamp and you got to say the magic words and the genie pops out and you got three promises. And you think that's your prayer life. You say, oh, okay, I got, the, I got the right formula and I say the right words and now God's got to do what I want him to do. That's not what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. The sum of your prayers is not you getting God to conform his will to yours. Some of you make me nervous. When I listen to you pray, I hear you giving God instructions on how he needs to run the universe. You giving God instructions on what he needs to do. And you don't see that as problematic? You see, he's saying, listen, it's not about me being conformed to your will, but you coming to me and saying, Lord, in your name, meaning in your will, in your purposes, here I am. I am the vessel indwelt by the divine presence, and how, Lord, do you want to live through me. He says that the, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You see, the sum of life is all about what brings glory to God. The sum of life is not what we accumulate. The sum of life is not our possessions. The sum of life is not our titles. He is the life. He's the way, the truth, the life. Our goal should be that whatever we pray for would only advance his will. And so we know 
that when we are agents surrendered to his divine purpose, he does it. Lord, what do you want to do through me? How do you want to give through me? How do you want to manifest your life through me? And our lives will begin to look like Jesus, who is the way, who is the truth, who is the life. Not a what, but a who. Living in you. Transforming the world that we live in. And so as we sang, Lord, let everything else fall off. And amazingly, we're going to find ourselves surrounded by notorious sinners who may very well make Pharisees feel very uncomfortable, but were loved by Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That is not just the destination but the journey. And Lord, teach me to enjoy every step of the journey with you who are the way, who is the truth and the only source of life. Amen.